Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video here at my channel, Jesus Truth. Thank you very much for stopping by. So, I have another amazing documentary for you guys. This one called Jesuits Erasing the Flat Earth. This video reinforces and verifies the information from the last video I did called Flat Earth, Jesuits and the Global Conspiracy. And once again, it exposes the greatest lie of all time, which is that we live on a globe Earth that is spinning through space, which is just ridiculous. This video was produced by the YouTube channel called MIGMAG. I will leave a link down below. And to MIGMAG, I would like to say thank you and much respect, brother, much respect for producing some great videos. So without further ado, sit back and enjoy the truth, and I will see you next time. God bless. Johnny Cerucci with another MIGMAG special report. For a thousand years, from roughly 500 AD to 1500 AD, the civilized world was controlled by Rome, but not military Rome, religious Rome. The Roman Empire had mutated from a military power into a religious one, co-opting the beliefs of Christianity and mixing them with ancient Egyptian, Greco, and Babylonian paganism. Christian doctrine that came directly from Jesus Christ and was transcribed in the Bible stated that each individual had the liberty and independence to govern their own salvation by cultivating a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The new religious Roman Empire insinuated herself in between Christ and the believer and said if you wanted to have your soul saved you had to rely on the priests, bishops, and cardinals of Rome. This was the worst kind of slavery because it was a slavery of disinformation. Now and again, sincere Bible-believing Christians like the Waldensians of the Alps, the Albigensians, Jerome of Prague, John Wycliffe and his Lollards, Jan Hus of Bohemia, would rebel against this Roman rule and show Christians that Vatican doctrines claiming that you needed Rome to ensure your salvation were contradicted by the Bible. As a result, the papacy strictly forbade Bibles to be placed into the hands of the common person and only allowed Jerome's Latin Vulgate to be handled by clergy. Men like John Wycliffe painstakingly translated the Vulgate into the language of the people. For Wycliffe, it was English. English Bibles were then slowly and carefully copied and handled by Wycliffe's followers who handed them out to and taught the people. In response, Roman authorities captured Wycliffe's followers called Lollards, tied their Bibles around their necks and burned them alive. It's what Christian, so-called Christian Rome did to all of her enemies, including Jerome of Prague and Jan Hus. John Fox's Book of Martyrs originally titled Acts and Monuments, is completely filled with examples of Catholic authorities torturing and murdering Christians. And when a Lollard was burned with a Bible hanging around his neck, it was a terrible loss because not only were Christians being burned alive, 
but hand-copied Bibles were irreplaceable. But in 1517, a new rebel stepped up, an Augustinian monk from Germany named Martin Luther. Luther was furious that Pope Leo X, Giovanni de' Medici, from the powerful Medici family who helped to rule the world then and including through to today, had sent their attack dogs, the Dominicans, to cheat the common people out of their money by claiming they could buy what is called an indulgence, which is basically a receipt of forgiven sin by paying money to indulgence peddlers like Johann Tetzel. Poor Christians believed that they had some of their sins forgiven. Worse, they were told that dead loved ones were in purgatory and they could give money to these indulgence peddlers and the Pope would then release their dead loved ones. Luther wrote 95 short paragraphs or theses and on November 1st, a 1517 All Saints Day posted them to the doors of All Saints Cathedral in Wittenberg. But what was different about Martin Luther's protest and the protests of previous Christians was the movable type printing press of Johannes Gutenberg. The 95 theses were translated and replicated by the Gutenberg press and spread like wildfire. Martin Luther instantly shot to number one on the Vatican hit list. Now remember, he was an Augustinian monk that didn't matter he was waking people up and freeing them from the Roman chains and for that he needed to be stopped he was kidnapped by his benefactor Frederick the Wise of Saxony and held at Wartburg Castle for several months to protect him from Vatican assassins during that time he translated the Bible into vernacular German and it may have been the most important thing he ever did starting with the New Testament and then later the Old Testament but now the Gutenberg Press started printing off large quantities of common language Bibles and the fires of the Inquisition couldn't keep up. Other brave Christians like William Tyndale, also a Roman Catholic priest, began translating Bibles into the language of their people. Tyndale was English like Wycliffe and he too was eventually executed by Rome for his crime. But now Rome had a problem. There were too many Bibles and Bible translators to be kept in check by burning them all. A new tactic was born, a tactic that English Cardinal Thomas Wolsey called learning against learning. And that tactic was to discredit the Bible in order to force people to return to accepting Rome as the ultimate authority over their body and soul. In this tactic of learning against learning, Rome would literally rewrite reality and weave a false reality matrix that we now all swim in to this day. For thousands of years, mankind understood the earth to be flat and stationary. Only rarely did men like Pythagoras attempt to claim otherwise. And it's interesting to note that many Freemasons consider Pythagoras to be one of the first of their craft. But now rewriting our reality as a tactic to discredit the Bible became a top priority in the face of Martin Luther's 1517 Reformation, Protestant Reformation, the Catholic response would be the Counter-Reformation, and it would be spearheaded by a Spanish Templar knight named Ignatius of Loyola and his followers, whom we call today the Jesuits. Their first opportunity came from the Vatican's mathematician, a Polish priest named Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus gave birth to the modern heliocentric model of the universe with his work De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. Copernicus knew he was weaving a matrix of lies and wanted to hold publication of De Revolutionibus until after his death. But powerful Roman Catholic clergy like Tiedman Gies, Bishop of Kolm, and the papal secretary himself, Johann Wiedmannstadt, forced him to publish in 1543. The facts that Catholic clergy forced Copernicus to publish, or that Copernicus was the Vatican mathematician, or that he received his doctorate in canon law from Bologna University, canon law are the precepts by which Rome governs nations, Adam Weishaupt was a doctor in canon law, or that he was a Roman Catholic priest. These have all been swept under the carpet. But Copernicus never married, and even the Catholic Encyclopedia had to note that in 1537, King Sigismund of Poland 
put Copernicus's name on the list of four candidates for the vacant Episcopal seat of Ermland, which makes it probable that at least in later life he had entered the priesthood. Also swept under the carpet has been the timing of the publication of De Revolutionibus, right on the heels of Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation. And if that's not clear enough for you, how about this? A Vatican agent named Jorg Joachim Redicus, who was originally born Jorg de Porus, had insinuated himself into the Luther Reformation and was in Wittenberg when he left to become a close student of Copernicus. Sources like Wikipedia claim that Redicus was sent from reformer Philip Melanchthon, a dear friend of Martin Luther. But it is absolutely Roman Catholic disinformation. In the table talk of Martin Luther, the great reformer is quoted as having said, There is talk of a new astrologer who wants to prove that the earth moves and goes round instead of the sky, the sun, the moon, just as if somebody were moving in a carriage or a ship might hold that he was sitting still and at rest while the earth and the trees walked and moved. But that is how things are nowadays. When a man wishes to be clever, he must needs invent something special. And the way he does it, he must needs be the best. The fool wants to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. However, as Holy Scripture tells us, so did Joshua bid the sun to stand still and not the earth. In his lectures on the book of Genesis, Luther said, We Christians must be different from the philosophers in the way we think about the causes of these things. And if some are beyond our comprehension, like those before us concerning the waters above the heavens, we must believe them and admit our lack of knowledge rather than either wickedly deny them or presumptuously interpret them in conformity with our own understanding. The great reformer Jean Calvin also known as John Calvin, called Copernicus a dreamer who has a spirit of bitterness and contradiction, reprove everything and prevent the order of nature. We will see some who are so de deranged, Calvin said, not only in religion, but who in all things reveal their monstrous nature that they will say that the sun does not move and that it is the earth which shifts and turns. When we see such minds, we must indeed confess that the devil possesses them and that God sets them before us as mirrors in order to keep us in his fear. So it is with all who argue out of pure malice, and that happily make a show of their imprudence. When they are told this is hot, they will reply, no, nope, it is plainly cold. When they are shown an object is black, they will say, no, nope, it is white, and vice versa. Just like the man who said that the snow is black, for although it is perceived and known all to be white, yet he clearly wished to contradict the fact. And so it is that they are madmen who try to change the natural order and even to dazzle eyes and benumb the senses. Do you think Calvin knew how the Freemasons were used by the Jesuits? When they are shown an object as black, they will say it is white? We're talking about our government here. No, we're talking about a crime, Bill, pure and simple. Y'all got to start thinking on a different level like the CIA does. Now we're through the looking glass here, people. White is black and black is white. Very quickly, Rome jumped upon this new model of the universe, and Jesuits like Christopher Clavius used Copernicus and his work to fabricate the Gregorian calendar, the calendar we all use. Rightly did the prophet Daniel say in chapter 7, verse 23, that during his vision, a being standing near him said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and intend to change times and laws. And the saints shall be given into his hand for a time. Very quickly did Rome and papal agents like the Jesuits begin to push this new cosmology. She took over astronomy and either pushed out or killed off anyone who contradicted the idea that the Earth was a globe spinning in space and revolving around the sun. Even those that met her halfway didn't keep her happy and she dealt with them as well. T. 
Teague Ottenson Brahe, whose nickname was Tycho, accepted the idea that the Earth was a globe spinning in space, but still believed that his own observations and data proved that the Earth was the center of the solar system and not the Sun. This is known as geocentrism. Tycho wanted to follow in the steps of Martin Luther and studied at the University of Wittenberg, but was forced out by the plague. Brahe's life appeared to be frequently in danger, and in 1566 he lost a large portion of his nose in a duel. He was 20 years old at the time. He later died under mysterious circumstances at the very young age of 54. One of those who claimed it was simply an illness, a bladder infection contracted during a banquet in Prague, was his understudy Johannes Kepler. Kepler was a German astronomer and supposedly a Lutheran, yet he had an intimate relationship with Jesuits. In 1597, Archduke Franz Ferdinand II of Austria banished all Protestants, good Roman Catholic that he was, and Kepler fled to Hungary. But the Jesuits intervened and convinced Ferdinand to allow him to return. Kepler grew up with a Jesuit uncle under the same roof of their house in Wildestadt. Uncle Sedaldus was a Jesuit astrologer who also kept a wife. Upon the unexpected death of Tycho Brahe, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II immediately promoted Kepler to replace him as imperial mathematician, and Kepler very quickly went to work rewriting all of Brahe's observations to be interpreted as heliocentric and not geocentric. In a paper titled Kepler's Relation to the Jesuits, Dr. Jörg Schuppner at the University of Leipzig noted that it is well known that the order of the Jesuits was the most important and the most active Catholic order in the field of science during the 17th and 18th centuries. One field of particularly intensive successful study carried out by the Jesuits was astronomy. Many of their names are associated with the important discoveries in the history of astronomy, such as the discovery and mapping of moon craters. It is nearly impossible to list all the names of those who made serious contributions as astronomers or mathematicians. One aspect of the considerable role the Jesuits played in the history of astronomy was their support of Johannes Kepler. Some of them stood in extensive correspondence with Kepler. Now, it was obvious to protesters like Luther and Calvin that something fishy was going on in Rome, and the papacy needed plausible deniability while she rewrote our reality. That propaganda was presented by Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo Galilei, and it's absolutely fascinating what user-edited Wikipedia says in the entry for Galileo Galilei under the subtitle Galileo, Kepler, and Theories of Tides. Cardinal Bellarmine had written in 1615 that the Copernican system could not be defended without, quote, a true physical demonstration that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun. Galileo considered his theory of the tides to provide that required proof of the motion of the earth. Now, there's no link on the name Cardinal Bellarmine, which is unusual for Wikipedia. Maybe that's because... Cardinal Bellarmine was Robert Bellarmine of the Society of Jesus, one of the most powerful Jesuits of his time, who was canonized a saint in 1930 and named a doctor of the church. What's more, it is ludicrous to imagine that the Earth's supposed large mass doesn't pull the moon and crash into it, and instead the magical force of gravity holds it stationary. Even more ridiculous is the idea that the moon affects tides by pulling on the water. Again, the magical, mystical force of gravity is blamed. South African author Thomas Winship wrote in 1899 his book, Zetetic Cosmogony. If the moon lifted up the water, it is evident that near the land the water would be drawn away and low instead of high tide caused. Again, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform. And it follows that if she exerted any influence on the Earth, that influence could only be a uniform influence. But the tides are not uniform. 
and wish it uses examples from South Africa. At Port Natal, the rise and fall is about six feet, while at Bira, about 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. This effectually settles the matter that the moon has no influence on the tides. But Protestant reformers were on to Rome. She knew she needed a smokescreen, and she provided it. Suddenly, history was rewritten, and rather than pushing with her own agents, like Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and others, to rewrite our cosmology, suddenly, the papacy was a defender of the flat earth. Well, just look what they did to poor Galileo. Let's do. Supposedly, Galileo was tried for heresy at the hands of that evil flat earther, Jesuit Robert Bellarmine. He bravely stood by his guns and humiliated the church with a heliocentric spinning ball earth. What happened to Galileo Galilee? Well, for the last few years of his life, he was put under house arrest. Have you read anything about the Inquisition? Do you know what the Inquisition did to people when it truly considered them an enemy? Things like rotating their arms backwards until they were pulled out of their sockets? Inventing special instruments that could be jammed into a person's body to rip open their bowels? Putting them in a special sarcophagus filled with spikes that would jam into them to the bone? Did you ever hear of Edgar Allan Poe? Are you familiar with his short story, The Pit and the Pendulum? About a swinging, razor-sharp pendulum that lowered across a victim and would take hours to slowly saw that victim in half? Did you know it was based upon the Inquisition? A little-known secret is that the Jesuits now own astronomy. When their missionaries went across the world, across our flat Earth, the first thing they did was insinuate themselves in royal courts to become the official astronomer of that kingdom. China is a great example. One of the first Jesuits in China was Matteo Ricci. Ricci and his successors like Adam Schall and Ferdinand Verbiest were all the royal court astronomers and eventually fabricated the calendar for the Chinese emperor. Today, the Jesuits even have their own observatories, both in Italy and in America. They use their puppets in American government to steal Apache holy ground on Mount Graham in Arizona. Are they reaching out extraterrestrially or interdimensionally? They appear to have answered our question with the latest piece of technology on Mount Graham the large binocular telescope near-infrared utility with camera and integral field unit for extragalactic research, also known as Lucifer. And it's not surprising given the success the Jesuits have had in rewriting our reality. Now we're supposed to believe that Rome was against the spinning ball earth heliocentric cosmic accident cosmology of our modern understanding Yet at every step of the way, Jesuits or Jesuit agents were there to bolster our false reality, hiding whenever possible behind convenient Jews. And for more on that, see our special report, It's the Jews, from Johnny Cerucci and Migmag, needing to contrive an origin for our accidental existence that contradicts the Bible. Jesuit-trained Belgian priest Georges Lemaitre is the father of the so-called Big Bang Theory, the idea that first there was nothing and then it exploded. He was a close co-worker of just such a Jewish puppet, Albert Einstein. Einstein bolstered the Jesuit cosmology with his convoluted theory of relativity. The problem was that observations of both scientists and laymen weren't matching what so-called astronomers were telling us. And so Einstein fabricated the theory of relativity to claim that your reality was relative to the time-space continuum. It is purposefully almost impossible to understand. You're just supposed to trust science and astronomy. The Jesuits then jumped on with dinosaurs and Charles Darwin to claim the Earth is billions of years old. 
And wherever Darwin's theory of evolution had holes, Jesuits stepped up to fill the gap. Jesuits like Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the father of the New Age. After fabricating the ape-like pre-humans that we supposedly came from, even students of evolution became concerned that there was a, quote, missing link between primitive apes and modern humans. A discovery was made in 1912 to bridge that gap. Having been found in Piltdown, East Sussex, England, it was named Piltdown Man. Unfortunately, it was also found to be a hoax. The skull of a small human with the altered mandible and teeth of an orangutan. Sometime later, paleontologist Stephen J. Gould uncovered the father of that hoax, a Jesuit priest named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. There are many such examples in archaeology and paleontology, and yet no one asks, why would so-called scientists be fabricating evidence? The goal was to discredit the Bible, and it has been resoundingly successful. Without the spinning ball earth, Darwinian dinosaur cosmic accident, the Bible is a science textbook. With it, critics laugh and question the Bible, and instead look to human authorities to save their souls, such as the Vicar of Christ himself, who is for the first time in Roman Catholic history a Jesuit priest. This has been Johnny Cerucci for a MiGMAG special report.